Hi everyone, um, welcome to Burns Falls first Financial Services Academy session of 2022. Many thanks for joining us today. I'll give people just another minute or so, but we've got quite a lot to cover today, so I will get started fairly shortly. And just as a bit of a recap, if you've been to these sessions before, you'll already know, um, but just in case you haven't, these were intended to be short introductions to financial services regulatory topics for compliance professionals, lawyers, and anyone who would like to learn a bit more about financial services. So just before we get into the main part of the presentation, I've got a few pieces of housekeeping, which I'll cover just now. Um, I would be grateful if you could please keep your cameras off and microphones off during the presentation. We may not have time for questions, but our contact details are on the final slide, so please do get in touch with us if there is anything you would like to discuss. Also, this session is being recorded and it will be distributed following the presentation. So your speakers today will be myself, Lorna Stephen, a senior solicitor in the financial services regulatory team, and I'll take you through an introduction to AML and financial crime legislation, relevant offences, and the recent fine against NatWest for AML fa failures. Sylvia Matheson, a solicitor in our team, will talk about the new developments in the area of financial crime and AML, particularly focusing on the economic crime levy and what's on the horizon. And we will close the short Q&A session with Craig Wilson of Amicus, a digital AML platform provider who will give us, give us his practical take on this. So let's get started. What is AML, financial crime, and where do I find it? The best place to start is by looking at the key pieces of money laundering and financial crime legislation, and I've listed the main ones on the slide. The first piece of legislation to be aware of is the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002, which is usually referred to as POCA. Money laundering is defined in POCA as the process by which the proceeds of crime are converted into assets which appear to have a legitimate origin so that they can be retained permanently or recycled into further criminal enterprises. This legislation is only applicable to proceeds of crime laundered after the 24th of February 2003. POCA consolidated, updated and reformed the law relating to money laundering to include any dealing in criminal property and gave the Crime Prosecution Service the power to confiscate the proceeds of crime. The second piece of legislation, which is a bit of a mouthful, is the Money Laundering, Terrorist Financing and Transfer of Funds Information on the Payer Regulations 2017, as amended by the Money Laundering, Terrorist Financing Amendment Regulations 2019. This is usually what people are referring to when they say the Money Laundering Regulations, or MLRs for short. The latest amendment updates the UK's AML regime to incorporate international standards set by the Financial Action Task Force and transposes the EU's fifth money laundering directive into UK law. So I appreciate I've already thrown quite a few acronyms around for, for first thing on a Wednesday morning. And personally, I find financial crime and AML the most dark and heavy area of financial services. So before we go any further, I've set out some key terms on the slide. This list is by no means exhaustive and I won't go through them all now, but they might be useful if you want to go back and look into this after the session. So now we've had a quick look at what AML is and the legislation underpinning it, I'll move on to the potential offences under AML legislation. So the first offences we'll look at are the direct proceeds of crime offences under POCA. These require an individual to directly handle the proceeds of crime, whether that's by laundering the funds or by using the criminal property. The first offence we have on the slide is to conceal, disguise or transfer the proceeds of crime. This is the archetypal money laundering offence and might occur where someone uses the criminal money to purchase a property or seeks to put it into a UK bank account, making the funds look clean because of being handled by national UK bank. The second offence we have on the slide is to enter into an arrangement which the person knows or suspects involves the proceeds of crime. This is often referred to as aiding and abetting, so the perpetrator is not directly committing the crime which rendered the proceeds but may not be asking too many questions. And the final offence we have on the slide is to acquire, use or possess the proceeds of crime. This could occur where an individual handles stolen goods, for example, a bike stolen during a burglary. But what links all three of these offences is that they require either a knowledge or suspicion that the proceeds of crime may be involved. But what is suspicion? Suspicion is highly subjective and may differ from person to person. It will ultimately be down to the particular facts and circumstances and the individual involved. However, the courts have confirmed that the bar is relatively low for suspicion. 
it needn't be clear or firmly grounded and targeted on specific facts, just that it must be more than merely fanciful. And suspicions may be in relation both to someone who may have perpetrated the crime and as, as against those who may be facilitating or benefiting from it. So now moving on to the reporting offences. So as I've alluded to already, offences in relation to money laundering aren't limited to direct dealings with the proceeds of crime. Offences may also be committed where individuals fail to report suspicions or tip someone off that an investigation is taking place. The first few offences on the slide relate to failures to disclose either on the part of the individual or a nominated officer, such as a money laundering reporting officer. These can take place where the individual or money laundering reporting officer is in receipt of information which could give rise to reasonable knowledge or suspicion that money laundering is taking place, but they fail to make a disclosure to the relevant officer or national crime agency as applicable. The third offence on the slide is tipping off, which is where an individual suspects that someone else is involved in money laundering, which is under investigation, and informs the person under suspicion or any person likely to prejudice the investigation. And the final offence we have here which ties into tipping off is the more general prejudicing investigation and would require an individual to make a material disclosure to any other person which could prejudice the investigation or interfere with relevant material. So this offence could be committed by anyone who has any knowledge which could be prejudicial to the investigation were it to be disclosed. And lastly, I wanted to quickly touch on the criminal offences under the money laundering regulations. So the first one we have here is contravening a relevant requirement. It, it is a very broad category and it can include failings of the firm's policies, controls and procedures and failings in customer due diligence, amongst others. And it's not necessary to prove that money, money laundering did in fact take place in order to prosecute a breach of the contravention of relevant requirements under the money laundering regulations. It only needs to be proved that the relevant requirements of the regulation were not followed. As with offences under POCA, prejudicing an ongoing investigation is also an offence, as well as providing false or misleading information and tipping off. So that has been a whistle-stop tour of the main offences under money laundering legislation. There are quite a lot of them, and both firms and individuals should be allowed their responsibilities under the regulations. So we'll now move on to discuss the NatWest case and the very real impact of repeated AML failings. So this case was the first criminal prosecution brought by the FCA in relation to AML failings by NatWest, which illustrates the potential cost of AML failings and the regulator's appetite to seek criminal prosecutions under the regulations. I set out on the slide one of the quotes from the sentencing remarks. Although in no way complicit in the money laundering which took place, the bank was functionally vital. Without the bank and without the bank's failures, the money could not be effectively laundered. So what went on in this case? NatWest client was a business called Felder Oldfield, a buyer and seller of gold, which first became a customer of NatWest in 2011. When Felder Oldfield was taken on as client, it was anticipated that NatWest would not handle cash for them. In November 2013, Felder Oldfield started to deposit cash with NatWest, starting with 148,000 in November 2013 and increasing to 2.3 million in June 2014. This was a significant change in the business activity visible to NatWest and should have triggered a review event. Whilst alerts were triggered in relation to these large cash deposits and the transactions were investigated, the investigators had insufficient information on the client. They failed to consider the cumulative impact of the number of alerts triggered and no periodic reviews of the clients were carried out. The business was originally given a high risk rating in the system. However, this was reduced to low in December 2013, despite the change in business activity. This has recurred automatically as a result of a remediation program rather than a bespoke assessment of the risks of the client. And it wasn't just alerts being triggered that, um, that went on in this case. Concerns were also raised by branch and cash centre staff. Branch staff became suspicious when Fowler Oldfield was depositing black bin bags full of cash and some so large the branch's safe wasn't big enough. Cash centre staff were also concerned due to the high volumes of cash, the high volumes of Scottish notes, as well as the slightly musty smell from the cash, indicating that they hadn't been used for business purposes. So in all instances, concerns raised were dismissed in favour of an account from the relationship manager that this type of activity was normal for the client. Until finally, in 2016, NatWest was contacted by West Yorkshire Police when they suspected that a large-scale money laundering operation was being run out of Fowler Oldfield, 
and NatWest reported this to the FCA. It was, however, noted in the sentencing remarks that NatWest cooperated with the regulator throughout the investigation and that they had made steps to address the failings identified. Ultimately, and you'll see on the slide, NatWest was fined £264,772,619.95 following convictions for three offences of failing to comply with the money laundering regulations. This case not only shows the possible financial consequences for AML failings, but the appetite of the regulator to raise criminal prosecutions for breaches of the regulations, something we hadn't seen until this case was brought. So I'll now hand you over to Sylvia to tell us what is on the horizon in the area of financial crime and AML. So thanks, Lorna. It's good to get some of the jargon busted as there is a lot of it in this area. Um, so firstly, it's great to kick off the first of our spring series with the session on AML and financial crime. Prior to qualifying as a solicitor, I spent just over four years working as a compliance professional in financial crime and risk. So this aspect of financial services regulatory is what most interests me. So now Lorna has given us an overview of the current AML and financial crime legal framework. I'm going to delve into what has very recently changed and what is still to come in the near future for the UK's AML and financial crime regime. So I'm going to discuss the economic crime levy. I'll then look at what changes the Economic Crime Transparency Enforcement Act has brought in. I'll then look more generally at what's on the horizon for the UK's regulatory framework. So turning first to the econo economic crime levy. So in July 2019, the UK government published a three-year economic crime plan for the period 2019 to 22. The plan sets out seven strategic principles and 52 action plans. Now, I won't go into the full 52 action plan points, but a key theme underpinning the plan is the joint participation of the public and private sector to deliver a holistic plan that defends the UK against economic crime, prevents harm to society and individuals, and protects the integrity of the UK economy. So at the time the plan was published, it was criticised for being too generalised, with a key missing aspect being any sort of commitment to funding. But fast forward to the spring 2020 budget, and the UK government announced that a new levy would be introduced to help fund government measures to tackle money laundering and financial crime. For those entities that are subject to it, the levy is significant. The levy will be payable by entities which are supervised for money laundering purposes, provided those entities meet the revenue thresholds. So businesses which require to be supervised for money laundering are those which fall within the regulated sector. And these are listed on the slides and include credit and financial institutions, legal professionals and insolvency practitioners and the more recent addition of crypto asset exchange providers. So the rate of levy payable by supervised entities will be based on that entity's size, based on their UK revenue. So current rates are set out in the Finance Act 2022, and again, they're also listed on the slide there. So the UK government considered that it was the fairest and simplest method to raise extra funding by only applying the levy to those entities which operate in sectors considered to be at higher risk to money laundering, although an exception for small businesses was also proposed. And at the consultation stage of the levy, there was some discussion about separating out regulated activity from non-regulated activity and calculating who would meet the thresholds for payment of the levy. But ultimately, that proposal was rejected. It was thought too difficult for entities to be able to separate out their business activities in such a way. So the first payments of the levy will be due in the financial year beginning April 2023, with firms requiring to self-declare their levy status, so whether they're subject to supervision and whether their UK revenue falls within the bandings for the past financial year, and that will determine whether the, the levy is payable. So details on how the levy will be collected are found in the Economic Crime Anti-Money Laundering Levy Regulations. The regulations set out the mechanics of the levy, including assessment, payment, collection and recovery. So now turning to the newly enacted Economic Crime Transparency and Enforcement Act 2022, which I'll refer to as the ECA for ease. 
this bill was fast tracked through Parliament as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and the bill received royal assent on the 15th of March 2022. So the ECA has three main objectives to prevent and combat the use of land in the UK for money laundering purposes by way of a new beneficial ownership register of overseas entities that own UK property, and that's known as the Register of Overseas Entities. The second objective is to amend the unexplained wealth order regime. And thirdly, the third objective is introduction of a streamlined process for implementing sanctions and a strict liability test for monetary penalties imposed for breaches of sanctions legislation. So the new register of overseas entities will require any non-EU entity wishing to own land in the UK to be registered along with any beneficial owners and beneficial owners has the usual meaning. More than 25% of the shares or voting rights, or if they otherwise exercise control. And this requirement has retrospective effect. Overseas entities that already own land are compelled to register if the land was bought on or after the 1st of January 1999 in England and Wales, and the 8th of December 2014 in Scotland. Overseas entities will have a six month transitional period in which to dispose of their land or register. And it will be Companies House that is responsible for overseeing the register of overseas entities. The ECA also introduces new criminal offences of failing to register or making a false statement to the register of Companies House. Failure to register will also have an impact on the property's title and the ability to acquire or dispose of that property. Evidently, the intention behind the Register of Overseas Entities is to increase transparency of who actually owns property in the UK. The land has been, the UK has been heavily criticised for a lack of trans, a lack of visibility, and leaks such as the Panama Papers and the Pandora Papers have shown that UK property, particularly in London, is being bought up by foreign investors and, in some cases, used to conceal tainted wealth. So now turning to unexplained wealth orders. Unexplained wealth orders are court orders which can be granted where any politically exposed person is involved or any person suspected to be involved in serious crime and the assets concerned are greater than £50,000. Unexplained wealth orders can be granted by the court where the court is satisfied that there are reasonable grounds for suspecting that the person's source of income would be insufficient to acquire the property. In other words, the funds are suspected to be from ill-begotten gains. If granted, the order would require the respondent to explain the origins of their wealth as an, and it's an effective measure if accompanied by an application to freeze assets. The ECA widens the scope of unexplained wealth orders so that orders can be granted against not just individuals, but also responsible officers, which would include directors or partners, both in or outside of the UK. And the ECA also introduces an alternative test for the court in granting an order. An order can now be granted not only in circumstances where it's suspected that the person's income is insufficient, but also in circumstances where there are reasonable grounds for suspecting that the property has been obtained through unlawful conduct. So we've heard a lot about sanctions in recent weeks, and the ECA seeks to strengthen the UK's sanction regime, and the main takeaways are the Sanctions and Money Laundering Act 2018 is amended to create a two-tier designation system standard and urgent. The urgent designation process allows the UK to more easily impose sanctions against an entity or individual if that entity or individual is already designated by another regime, for example, the US, the EU, Australia. And since it's in, in action, the Foreign Secretary has used the urgent designation system to sanction over 370 individuals who are already sanctioned by the EU. The ECA also removes the requirement that a person must have known or suspected that they breached sanctions law in order for, to receive a monetary penalty, instead introducing a standard of strict liability for breaches. So I've discussed what's very recently changed in the AML and financial crime regulatory landscape. So now we're looking to what's on the near horizon. So it's been five years since the 2017 money laundering regs were enacted. So under 
Regulation 108, the Treasury is required to carry out regular reviews and to publish reports setting out the conclusions of each review. The Treasury launched its review on the 22nd of July 2021 by publishing a call for evidence and a consultation paper. So we can expect to see the results in the first report due this year on the 26th of June 2022. Among other things, the Treasury will be assessing to what extent the objectives of the money laundering regs remain appropriate and the extent to which their purpose could be achieved in ways that involve less onerous regulatory provisions. The expected review, review will provide an opportunity to ensure that the UK's AML and financial crime regime responds to the UK's particular circumstances and risks, um, one being that you now the, the UK has left the EU. So we can likely expect to see more coverage on crypto assets, supporting the adoption of new technology, more on risk-based decision-making, particularly around due diligence, and preventing bad actors from entering the regulated sector. So businesses and compliance professionals may well be apprehensive will this spell additional compliance burdens for businesses. And we are increasingly seeing new technologies being developed to assist firms in meeting their AML and regulatory compliance obligations. Regulators, including the FCA, are encouraging of new technologies, which make processes more efficient. But of course, businesses subject to the obligations under the legislative framework will want to ensure that these solutions are not only efficient, but compliant. So we're now going to hear a little bit from Craig Wilson, who is Relationship Manager at Amicus, and he can speak to this a little bit more. So we're delighted to welcome you, Craig. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, perhaps you would like to introduce yourself and then Lauren and I will pick your brains a little bit more. Thanks for that. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Craig Wilson. Uh, I work at Amicus as a Relationship Manager. Amicus is a digital platform for anti-money laundering, compliance and digital ID verification uh, and is in fact used by Bernice Paul. Great. So my first question relates to the digitalization of KYC and compliance. So we've touched on it a little bit, but we're seeing more of KYC and AML processes becoming more digitalized. How then do compliance and legal professionals take comfort that potential risks are mitigated? Yeah, it's a, a great question. And you're absolutely right. More and more processes are becoming more digitized. And I think the pandemic's been a, a great driver of digitization and, and technological innovation within professional services. Amicus has currently been used by seven of the top 10 Scottish law firms, as I said, including Baroness, uh, to facilitate an efficient and robust AML process because there's many ways that digital platforms mitigate risk in comparison to more traditional paper-based approaches. Uh, firstly, looking at it from the perspective of the Money Laundering Reporting Officer, the MLRO within our firm, Digital platforms allow them to implement a scalable and consistent AML process that ensures everyone within the firm is doing the same suite of checks on all clients to make sure that no one is doing their own thing that might lead to important aspects of due diligence being missed out. They also allow for an automatic digital audit trail that records everything that's taking place with regards to each client's due diligence and that allows NLROs to quickly and easily perform internal audits to ensure the firm is meeting their compliance obligations and that there aren't going to be any nasty surprises when their annual audit comes around. Looking at things from the perspective of the frontline AML staff, the, the people within the firm that are actually carrying out the checks, Digital platforms reduce a lot of the worry and stress when it comes to uh, authenticating ID documents. Now, if I was carrying out the due diligence on a new client, I might be comfortable verifying the authenticity of a UK passport or driver's license. Whereas if some, a client came into the office with a foreign issued ID, I might struggle to know exactly what I'm looking for to prove its authenticity. You know, do I know what the correct fonts are meant to look like? How about the layout? 
are the, the MRZ numbers along the bottom of the passport displayed in the correct format? An ID itself may look genuine on the surface, but how can I be certain? Digital platforms mitigate that risk by being able to verify and authenticate government issued ID from countries all over the world. And Amicus is able to do um, ID verification for 195 countries in the world. Um, it's also very easy these days for individuals to download convincing looking templates of household utility bills or bank statements that they might use to verify their current address. Digital platforms can use different data sources to verify address uh, independently. So the likes of a credit reference agency can be used to verify clients' home address by looking at their credit history there. Uh, and, and you're gathering that information from a third party source that can't be defrauded in any way by the client. And finally, there are huge security advantages of using digital platforms. Uh, the platforms tend to be end to end encrypted for gathering that highly sensitive data that's required to complete client due diligence. Uh, there's a lot of firms out there that still use the likes of email to gather the IDs and copies of bank statements and utility bills which is, is not a very secure way of, of gathering that data. Uh, and in fact, 83% of um, data breaches are the result of email misuse. Uh, with, without processes in place to regularly cleanse email inboxes, uh, what this means is there could be hundreds of ID documents sitting in the inboxes of uh, fee earners uh, that are, are just waiting to be um, hacked by, by scammers and fraudsters. So what new technology allows us for a better way of doing existing tasks? One example of that is the use of the open banking technology that's starting to become more widespreadly adopted as this allows firms to digitally gather banking transactions directly from the banks themselves using bank grade encryption. And this avoids the likes of um, digital tampering or fraud when carrying out source of funds checks. So this means that clients no longer need to email in scans or PDFs of statements that may be intercepted by uh, hackers and fraudsters. That's all really interesting, Craig, thank you. And I, I'm sure a lot of us on this call will have seen the move towards more digital ways of doing things in the last couple of years. Um, so the next question I kind of wanted to ask relates back to, to what I was discussing earlier. Um, so touched on the, the AML failings in the NatWest case, uh, which is obviously the first criminal prosecution brought by the FCA. What are your top tips for any organisations looking to avoid repeated failings? Yeah, this was a, a very interesting case, um, especially for the fact that criminal charges were brought sets of a precedence of how seriously money laundering needs to be taken by firms. I, I think uh, firms and individuals within them often feel so far removed from the horrible crimes that money laundering actually facilitates, such as human trafficking and, and the drugs and arms trades. What this, one of my top tips as to what this means is that firms need to um, create a cultural mindset within an organization where AML and client due diligence is thought of as a key component of the onboarding experience and not just a tick box exercise that they need to do. Um, it's also very important that um, firms continue to monitor clients on an ongoing basis and then adjust the level of risk if that client relationship was to change. So in the NatWest case, the, the customer was a, a client of the bank for a number of years and initially when they, they, they uh, started the working relationship, it was understood they wouldn't be handling any cash for the client. Over time, they ended up receiving over 250 million pounds in cash. And so they should have been ongoing, uh, monitoring the client on an ongoing basis and revisiting their risk assessments at intervals and adjusting the level of risk of money laundering when required. So in this case, the very first time the client deposited cash, they should have been re-evaluating their, their um, assessment of the level of risk. So it's important to monitor clients over time and adjust the level of risk accordingly. 
Um, digital platforms are great for this because they allow you to, to automatically monitor clients over time and receive notifications when things change and also set reminders to refresh your, your risk assessments at intervals. And I think one of the most important things here is that there needs to be standard operating procedures in place when it comes to flagging high risk clients and transactions to the MLRO or to the relevant authorities. Uh, as you mentioned, in this case, there are multiple attempts to raise suspicions of money laundering that were never investigated and no appropriate action was ever taken. So make it very clear to the frontline AML staff who and where they should go if they, if they want to report suspicious activity. Thanks, Craig, that's really topical. Now, I know we are right on time, but I'm gonna squeeze in one more question if I can. Um, another topical one. So obviously there's there's been a huge change in international sanctions regimes in recent weeks um, because of the conflict in Ukraine. So uh, sort of broadly, how does a firm like Amicus re respond to that sort of overhaul of legislation and sort of huge, like changes in, in and, um, and law, how does Amicus respond? Yeah, I mean, the, the impact of the recent Ukraine, uh, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia has created such a rapidly changing sanctions environment that it's important that all firms establish the potential impact it could have on their business. So any um, transactions or new clients or existing clients that may have a Russian connection, you wanna make sure that you're doing effective due diligence on that. So with regards to, to what we've done to, to react to this, our worldwide coverage of PEPs and sanctions data supplied and verified by a data supplier called Comply Advantage. They're a global leader of real-time global sanction screening. And so in response, their sanction screening teams have been operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And as a result, any sanctions updates that are going live into their database are included in Amicus's PEPs and sanctions results, ensuring that our clients are not violating any UK laws by excluding those from their searches. And we're very proud to share that the latest UK sanctions were added to our databases within 17 minutes of their announcement. Thanks, Craig. I, I think that that's really interesting. Obviously, you know, it, it's something that's very current at, at the moment. So, so thank you very much for joining us today um, and for, for being our guest speaker. So as Sylvia mentioned, we are just right on time, maybe a little bit over. Um, so I'll wrap the session up there. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And obviously, thanks very much to Craig Wilson for coming along and giving us his practical take as well. I hope you all found today's session useful. Looking ahead to next week, I should mention that we'll be continuing with the second session in our series next Wednesday, looking at the rise of buy now, pay later. So I'd love to see you all there. And with that, we'll close the session and I hope you all have a great day.